It's a collection of 18 hexagons is 21 feet across. It's huge. And so we need that uh, in order to see the most distant and mo most faint objects. Now I'll show you where it goes. It's going into orbit around the Sun and Earth at the same time. Um, there's a, a number of places that move around the Sun with the Earth. They're called Lagrange points. So here's one. It's a million miles out farther from the Sun than we are. Here we are. There's the, the Lagrange point. So it's going to go out there. It's a million miles from us. And that does, of course, mean that we can't get there to service this observatory the, the way that we have for Hubble. So it uh, means we have to get it right. I want to show you how big is this observatory in a sort of more tangible way. Here is a team at Goddard Space Flight Center of about a couple of hundred engineers and scientists working on it. This is a full-scale mock-up, uh, not exactly the way it's going to be built, but it uh, shows you how big it is. Uh, and there are about ten times as many people as this elsewhere in the world building this observatory. And that's about what it takes to build great observatories. It's similar to what it took to build the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, but it's a lot smaller than what it took to go to the moon. A half a million people worked on the Apollo project. So uh, now I want to show you how it folds up. Uh, the telescope is much bigger than the rocket, so it has to be an origami kind of telescope. It's very carefully folded to fit inside the top of the rocket. It will unfold after the launch, and here is a movie of how it will unfold. First comes out the solar panels and the antenna to talk back to the Earth. Then the uh, protective uh, sun shield pops out. Then um, the, the uh, shield will continue to come out. Um, here we see it stretching out. Um, then um, after that's completed, then the telescope will pop into shape. And this uh, movie of it is going about 10,000 times faster than the real thing. Obviously, we'll be very cautious about this because we can't fix it if we goof. <coughs> so. Uh, uh, you're about to see it rotate around. The, the uh, rest of the telescope will pop out, and then it'll be finished. <coughs> this is all happening while it's on, making its uh, trip to the Lagrange point. It takes a couple of months to get all the way out there. <coughs> so now, finally, the telescope will pop into shape. So there it is. OK, well, we're coming along quite well with the assembly. Uh, here is a uh, test mirror that we've made. You can see it's shiny. Uh, and you can see how big it is. Now, the, uh, an individual human being can actually lift one of these pieces of the mirror. So this is a tremendous uh, technology improvement that we've made. It used to be there was no way you could come close to that. It would take 10 people to lift that in the old way of doing this. Uh, we have learned how to make a, an adjustment. All these 18 pieces will not be in the right sh place when we launch. So We've made a scale model telescope, and we've learned how to adjust them using the mathematics that we got when we had to fix the Hubble Space Telescope. <clears throat> now I want to illustrate a few of the scientific points that we'll be pursuing. Uh, here's a computer movie of how two galaxies would collide. <clears throat> so that's how they would look. Now we have a picture. This is a real photograph from Hubble of how two galaxies do look. And now we're going to show you how they might continue to evolve and what will happen to them. The, the two of them merge. This this most amazing. Uh, collection in this uh, collision. And I have to tell you, uh, this might happen to us. In, uh, <coughs> in about one billion years, the Earth will become too warm to live on because the sun will get brighter. In about five billion years, uh, the Andromeda Nebula, that beautiful one that I showed you with the two satellites, it's coming at us and it's going to get us. Uh, so what's going to happen? The stars actually don't usually bump into each other, but they start to orbit differently. So. Our sun could go into orbit around the Andromeda Nebula. Uh, <coughs> then after 7.6 billion years, the sun will actually swell up to be so large that it'll include the Earth in its inside. We'll be actually be inside the sun at that time, and it'll be too warm to live here. So maybe we will have developed space travel. Uh, maybe not. <coughs> at any rate, it'll be different then. So. Um, that's one thing we want to learn about with the new telescope because we we don't get to watch the movie, but we got to see we get to see lots of snapshots of galaxies doing their thing, and hope to understand this process. <coughs> we will take pictures uh, like this one, which was taken with the Hubble. Um, it took two weeks to get this picture with the Hubble Space Telescope, and the things that we're actually looking for now that would be at the very most remote parts of the universe aren't even in this picture. So uh, we need a bigger telescope that can observe infrared to see farther away. And almost everything in this picture is a galaxy. 
Um, galaxies are very, very numerous out there. Um, so closer to home, we want to see how stars are born, uh, how our own star is born. Uh, here is a place called the Eagle Nebula, uh, where stars have just recently been made. And uh, you see these huge clouds of dust that are blocking our view. Uh, that's some of that recycled material that from previous generations is actually solid dust grains in space, and we can't see past them. But uh, if you use infrared radiation, you can see past the dust grains, and we have a picture from the ground um, that shows the same place uh, from the ground uh, with infrared. You can begin to see through the dust clouds and see how stars were made. Here's one that you couldn't even see before because it was completely blocked by the dust. So this is one of the things we want to do is to see how stars are being made. Um, there are places that uh, the, the Hubble telescope discovered in the constellation of Orion where the brand new stars have been made and they're visible as silhouettes against the background. So plenty of places to look to see new stars and maybe even inside these clouds might be signs of planets that are in there with them. So we have a movie that shows you how uh, planets might have formed. Uh, this is an artist's concept, not a real thing, obviously. Um, <clears throat> but here we, the picture is that there's a a, a cloud of uh, little rocks orbiting around the sun. And you see the little rocks passing each other. And eventually we imagine these little rocks, however they were made, they will start to stick together to make planets. So here come the little rocks. Um, <clears throat> maybe it was like that. But we sure would like to know. Well, we can study some places outside the solar system where this is currently happening. Um, and we can study our own solar system as well. But um, in the outer solar and around another star, this is a place called Fomalhaut. It's a very bright star in the southern sky. It's the brightest uh, star in the southern fish constellation. Uh, and so we found this star that has a ring of dust orbiting around it. We've seen it with both the Hubble telescope and the Spitzer Space Telescope. And the amazing thing is this ring of dust is not even centered on the star. So why would that be? Uh, one uh, possible good reason is there's a planet that's pulling the dust grains away from the middle. And we can calculate where it is, and how big it is, and how bright it is. And we calculate that we should be able to see it with our new telescope. Uh, there is another way that we have to look for planets. Uh, once in a while, a planet will go between us and its home star. So we have a movie of a remarkable thing. This is the moon going in front of our home star. And it doesn't usually look like that from here on Earth. This is a picture taken with a NASA observatory in space, a little farther away. Anyway, this is the real sun. Uh, seen, with, seen with an observatory called the Stereo. Uh, and so um, it, it would just, we were very lucky to see that. Now, um, and uh, here's an animation of what it might be like for a more distant star, a very a more, more slow motion sort of thing. This uh, little planet's going across its distant star. It would typically take about six hours to do this. Uh, what we will see is that the distant star gets a little fainter for a little while because this planet is blocking some of the light. And we'll also see that some of the light from the star is going through the atmosphere of the planet. So we get to study the chemistry uh, of the atmosphere of that planet. So uh, if the planet were alive and had uh, certain things in it, we would be very fascinated to know that. Um, now maybe we will, maybe we won't be able to do it this time, but it's definitely a powerful technique. And there's an observatory which will be launched next year called the Kepler, which should observe uh, maybe five, maybe 50 Earth-like planets doing this in front of other stars, and hundreds or thousands of bigger planets doing it. So we've got lots of targets to follow up for this method. So there's a chance, even by this method, to see if those planets themselves have moons. It's a quite an astonishing, powerful technique, which is already being used uh, today. We already know, for instance, that there are, is one, satellite, one star whose planet has methane in the atmosphere. And there's a sign of water and sign of, uh, of, of sand grains or uh, silica dust in, in one of these. So that's one thing to do. Uh, once in a while, we get the opposite ha effect happens. Here is an uh, um, artist's concept of a planet that's going to go behind its star. So here now, um, if the planet goes behind its star, the light will also get a little bit fainter because the star is blocking the light from the planet. So if we can measure this, and we have already with the Spitzer Space Telescope, we can begin to learn about the planet. So we've even been able to calculate something about the wind on one of these planets because of the way the temperature of the planet changes as it goes around the star. So very, very powerful technique to look for uh, things about planets around other stars. 
Now, one of the great missions of uh, astronomy in general seems to be